you so much. Uh, let me, and thank you for the two presentations. <coughs> and I will have uh, six comments I want to, to talk in these five minutes I have. And I am tracking my time, so I stay on time. Uh, the first one is on what Kim presented and, and the importance of, of looking at trade and growth. And, and I think there are many economists in the world that have opted for the idea of free trade and trying to do bilateral and, and, and multilateral trade agreements. And the result is that their economies are growing. But as he clearly pointed out, there is a caveat, which is the distributional effects and what are the consequences of that growth as a result of trade. Uh, and at IFPRI, we have been trying to, to be able to develop tools that will allow us to look at the distributional effect. So taking all these global models and trying to understand what it means for a country within the country of the changes in, in opening uh, and having this trade relationship. And when we look at the countries and we look at the distributional effects of trade, we see a huge heterogeneity. And that, I think, is a very important point that you make, Kim, which I think we need to, to carefully look at, because if we want to improve the distributional effect, then we need to do policies, but those policies are very complex. Now, having said that, uh, Africa is, in, is a complex country in terms of, of tra free trade agreement, and free trade uh, and market access, because there is a huge heterogeneity within the economies, within the countries. So some countries are more open than others, so aggregate measures could not give exactly the, the correct uh, measure of what is happening within the different countries. The second issue which I think is important uh, is to look at the exports and if really this is a price effect or is a volume, uh, a change in volume, so I, I export more. So if we look at the, at the share of exports in oil, looking at quantities, they have not changed over time. So mostly it seems to me like this has to be a price effect. So. So it's not necessarily an increase in the share of quantity being exported, but it's a, an increase in the, in the share of the total value, which is a price effect. And the problem with this is that this creates some vulnerability. One vulnerability, of course, is to the exchange rate, which is something important to look, because most of West Africa is related to the Eurozone, and therefore that could have an effect over the trade policies and the effects of trade. But the second one is that if I want to look at, at, at the trade effects, and it's based on primary exports, oil and minerals, then for sure as a country, if I want to implement policies over time, it's very difficult because I am vulnerable to the commodity prices outside. And I don't have any control over those. So I have to be very careful. And I think there is where there is a lot that we can learn from other economies that have gone through this process. Chile, for example, they have developed mechanisms to be able to store money today to be able to expand in the future. And that allows us to have planning. So the booms that we are facing today shouldn't be looked as a boom, shouldn't be looked as good times from where I can accumulate so that I can smooth my consumption over the future, and that's, I think, uh, very, very important. So I think we need to learn a lot from, from other countries that have gone through this process and what mechanisms they have implemented and learned with mistakes to be able to uh, smooth this increase in income today, uh, to be able to use it properly uh, in, in the future. Now, another issue that we also need to look and be very careful is the Dutch disease, of course, no? Uh, and how much these effects on commodity prices, uh, on primary commodity prices, uh, could have uh, a localized effect and not uh, distribute across. Again, there is a lot of experience in, in taxes to primary exports, especially mining and oil, uh, from where we can learn. And one thing that I will say here, defining the law to be able to distribute uh, these taxes that are put in mining and oil needs to be a combined process of lawyers and economists. In most of the cases, it's done by lawyers. And they don't have an economic theory behind, an economic logic behind. And it's very difficult to get the returns from it. All the ones I have review, and I come from a primary exporting country, which is Peru, and I look at all the tax law on the mining industry, was, fixed, was, was problematic because of the way it was designed. So we need to carefully design those policies and learn from the other experiences around to be able to, to optimize uh, from those. Now, one topic which, which Kim mentioned, which I think is also central, is, is the issue of infrastructure and how I invest this money. Uh, and for me, there are three areas where uh, this increase in resources today can be used that will prolong the return over the future. One is infrastructure, which in Africa is central and is not a country level issue, it's a regional level issue. And I am really surprised that I have not heard too much about Cara Pillar 2. And Cara Pillar 2 was about infrastructure. It had a core objective of infrastructure and seems like it disappeared. And that has to be a regional issue because of the low population density in, in, in Africa. So I think it's something that governments here need to think again. Why we're going to throw all that effort that was to design Cara Pillar 2 
uh, where infrastructure was a core element to improve market access and competitiveness, which will have a huge effect. Just to, to have an idea, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, in irrigated land is only doing 3.6% of the potential irrigated land. So it's a huge gap. The, the cost of infrastructure, in, in, of access to infrastructure in Africa is several times more expensive than any other regions. So if you want to go through a policy of opening and competing with the world, those are huge constraints. And that's long-term investment that you can do and you can reduce the gap, which right now is around 93 billion per year that you need to invest in infrastructure. So that's a clear area uh, where you can put this money. The second one, which is more linked to, to the second presentation, is the fact of human capital and institutions which I think is central again. I always tell countries which are growing 6% a year, like is happening here, and when you start seeing growth of that level for 10 years, you really see the difference. Every time I come back to Senegal, I keep telling Usman, things are changing here, and things are changing in many African countries. But you are going to face a strong wall at some point, because you cannot keep growing at that velocity if you don't have the institutions in place, and especially if you don't have the human capital. And I am seeing it in my country, I am Peruvian has been growing 6-7% for the last 10-15 years, and today we have to import labor from outside, despite we have significant levels of unemployment, because we don't have the human capital with the skills needed to keep growing at the level we are. So I think the human capital issue, the informality, is a huge problem, and that is linked to institutions. If you don't have solid institutions, there is no way you will be able to keep growing and you will be facing a wall in the short term, because formality no, no matter how you define it, because basically the definition is a continuum, but basically what it gives you is rights, access to credit, access to markets. If you don't have the formality, you are not in the formal system and you don't get the benefits from it. And as you said, if you are in the rural areas, why will pay taxes if I don't get nothing about it? And the government is supposed to supply public goods, and that's infrastructure, that's institutions. So clearly I think there is a need to do that and, and to put an effort over that. And there are lessons that we can learn, uh, for example, making simplified mechanism to reduce informality. Instead of doing and, and, and burning all the different stages that other countries have burned, which you can jump to an oversimplified mechanism to give easy way for, to which people can become formal and small entrepreneurs can become formal uh, and to get the benefits from it. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Maximo. Voilà, nous avons suivi les deux Thank you very much, uh, Fawzi Sultan from IFPRI. Uh, the question I have is basically for Kim, uh, you look at all the exports of Africa and something with us and Massimo also mentioned, it's all outward going. And we see, we see a similar trend in a number of groupings of countries like the Middle East as well. There it's 90% of exports is oil. In Asia, the example, and this is something I'd like to hear from you, Kim, is uh, how much inter-African trade is there uh, similar to what is going on in Asia, where the inter-Asian trade uh, gives a big boost to the uh, to, to exports. Thank you.
Good, thank you. Thank you, Maximo, for those opening uh, comments. Um, certainly, it's true the liberalisation uh, of markets uh, to the opening up of trade in Africa is very mixed across the uh, continent. And uh, in particular, uh, it's mixed even within countries where uh, many countries had taxes or tax equivalents on exports, but simultaneously were restricting imports, which was the uh, focus of a recent question. And, um, and it's those taxes on exports that tended to be uh, phased out over the period since the 1980s, and that certainly encouraged agriculture. But simultaneously, um, restrictions on imports were not necessarily very much liberalised, and in some countries they've been increased. So there's been an anti-trade bias to the change in policies uh, within Africa um, as well, and so that's certainly uh, limiting the extent to which opening up to trade can contribute um, to growth. Um, Maximo made the point that at least in the case of petroleum there hasn't apparently been much increase in the quantity of exports, uh, that most of the gain from, from that trade growth has been via the increase in the price of um, energy raw materials. Um, but presumably over time that is having an encouraging effect and we've certainly seen that in Ghana, for example. Um, and so into the future one would hope there would be a, a, a larger quantity of those um, products available for export um, than in the past. But regardless of whether that quantity increases or decreases, there is the point that uh, the prices of these products don't stay high forever. And, uh, and once they come down, there will be the opposite terms of trade effect on, on uh, minerals and energy rich economies. And they'll have to try and cope with the, uh, the downturn in their economy that that would bring about. And there's very good um, uh, development of uh, economic theory and practice uh, to pra policy practice to um, uh, to draw on to work out how best to do that for your particular economy and it varies by economy as to whether you should be um, saving some of that through for example resource rent taxes and uh, exporting that into investments abroad to try and reduce the extent of the Dutch disease problem through the exchange rate appreciation, or whether the rates of return to investment, for example, in infrastructure in your own economy are so high that it's worth spending that money locally and uh, boosting the productivity of the rest of the economy and reducing the dust disease problem on the non-mining sector in that way. So there's various ways you can handle this, both in terms of the extent and nature of the taxation of resource rents, and then on the way in which you spend those savings that you might accumulate and Maximo stressed also the importance of looking at uh, developing institutions and building human capital as other ways to invest that money. Um, Fauzi, you asked the question about intra-African trade. That, that is very weak. It's an extraordinarily low uh, propensity to trade uh, within the region, within the continent and even within regions, even with neighbours. And that's especially the case in resource-rich countries uh, that build mines and then build a road or a railway down to the port and build the port infrastructure to deal with that mine export, that mineral export, uh, but do nothing else. And therefore it might be much more difficult to just trade with a neighbour a few kilometres away, a neighbouring country a few kilometres uh, away uh, than it is to export via that port. So that contributes, I think, to this intercontinental rather than intracontinental trade here. That contrasts extraordinarily with uh, what happens in Asia. That's the other extreme, where Asia's exports are predominantly manufacturers. They have extremely low trade costs within Asia. Uh, and with the uh, dr continual dropping in those trade costs, we're seeing this fragmentation of the production process so that there's many opportunities for countries to find a niche in which they can do a little bit of processing by importing some intermediate input and then reselling it, exporting it to another country for the next stage of production. So we were, we're now putting together a good database on value-added trade that gives us a better idea of the extent to which uh, um, that is uh, contributing to trade growth in different continents, and certainly Africa is at one end of the spectrum, Asia is at the other. Um, food standards certainly do limit uh, exports of agricultural products from Africa. Um, the, uh, the AGOA agreement, for example, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act that was meant to provide to 
Africans a, a preferential opportunity to access the US market had almost zero impact on food exports. Most of the benefit from that came from textile clothing exports. And the reason for that discrimination, what, what appeared to be discrimination, was it's in fact discrimination um, in the following sense, that you, you had to get over the hurdles of food standards in the US to be able to export there. And um, when Chile, for example, got an FTA free trade agreement with the US, the US uh, quarantine people sent 40 inspectors down to Chile to help clear stuff prior to shipment to get into the US market. When Agoa was set up, the US had six agents for the whole of the African continent to try and deal with that clearance. So there was no way any food was going to get into the US because it would never meet the standards. There was nobody here to tick the box that said that met the standards. And even flowers had to go through Amsterdam and, and get cleared from there and then exported on to the US rather than going directly. So food standards are a huge issue and uh, it does involve a lot more investment here in getting to know those standards, but it also requires help from the countries to whom you're trying to export uh, if they have, uh, if they're not providing inspectors to give pre-shipment clearance, then of course you just can't break over that hurdle. Finally, on the uh, question from our NGO friend uh, about um, import um, taxes uh, on food, uh, and of course if you impose those taxes you will encourage import substituting uh, production of those foods, but of course you do that at a cost. You're raising the price to consumers and consumers would have to pay more in the domestic market for those foods that otherwise could have been imported more cheaply. So that's not a, that's not a, a way to have a sustainable future. Uh, that's just protectionism of the normal kind and uh, um, it, it's much better to think of alternative ways to make those uh, import competing subsectors of agriculture more competitive, for example, through investing in R&D, things that actually generate an economic growth benefit for the country as well as helping those sectors. Thank you. Well done. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, nous allons nous sommes entrés d'atterrir